Hello, I'm Dr. Balthazar, and the MCU's forthcoming blockbuster, The Marvels, or if you live in the former celestial empire People's Republic of China, Captain Marvel 2, is soon to land in a theater near you. Content creators around the world have been eagerly anticipating what many expect to be a dumpster fire, although I'm not so sure. I suspect the Marbles, or Jingxi Deisho R. Hey, I think I got it that time. No, no, I didn't. Anyway, that rose by any name will probably be an example of uninspired blandness rather than robust idiocy. But I could be wrong. We shall see. But whether it flops spectacularly or with a barely audible whimper, the smart money says it's going to flop. And everyone involved is already preparing to minimize the collateral damage to their careers in entertainment. The director and co-stars will undoubtedly play the race card to protect their egos and gaslight the fans. But that's okay. Of the 8 billion people on the planet, there's probably only 5 or 6 left that haven't been called racist yet. And they know they're on borrowed time. While America's darling Brie Larson is moving along from that beloved Captain Marvel character the masses have been clamoring to see more of. That's very true, I think. Brie tends to elicit a response from sections of the general public that makes Rachel Zegler seem endearing by comparison. <laughs> Although maybe she deserves a bit more sympathy than she tends to elicit from the interweb. It's doubtful, but still possible. I think even her most ardent detractors have to admit she's a talented actress on the big screen. It's her performances on the small screens that are just fumbled right the fuck up, time after time. Let's take a close look at those, and see if we can't prescribe a little sympathy to go along with the usual intensely polarized reaction to her being, well, the way she is on the regular. If you're sticking around, thanks for coming aboard, love your face, never forget our time together, like, subscribe, all that. We have to start with the fact that her name isn't Brie Larson, that's a stage name. It's Brienne de Saulniers. Or if you go with the French pronunciation over the anglicized one, de Saulniers. They're pretentious enough both in the Golden State and Quebec province that I could see that being the case. All right, fuck you, buddy! Well, what kind of asshole hides behind an alias instead of using their real name? Ah, fuck me. That's not the first time I've walked into that one. Looking really good today, buddy. Looking real good. The psychology of aliases are interesting, be it stage names, pen names, or pseudonyms. For political commentators expressing unpopular opinions, they let you control how much backlash comes directly at you, which in the case of repressive regimes, is what will keep you picking the daisies instead of pushing them up. Francois-Marie Arouet, better known as the philosopher Voltaire, had something like 180 different pen names and still rightfully lived in constant fear of arrest and censure. As a man, I'm flesh and blood. I can be ignored. I can be destroyed, but as a symbol. For successful performers, they provide an answer to the imposter syndrome in which people like Beyonce, who are really good at what they do, are paralyzed of self-doubt. They feel like they don't deserve the accolades they receive and are just an imposter of some kind, so they create an alias. In Beyoncé's case, Sasha Fierce, who can be the things they are without feeling guilt and confusion. For unsuccessful performers, they provide some ego defense. It's not me who kinda sucks, it's the character I'm playing. <laughs> Draw your own conclusion about who might make a good example there. And more than anything, they let you play a character that you can shape as you like. You get to be far more flexible with your viewpoints and the side of your personality you want to highlight without being disingenuous with your value system. You get to try something fresh and new, without the weight of prior expectations getting in the way, and see if you like it. All that is to say, it's very possible we only know the character of Brie Larson as portrayed by Brienne de Saulnier in speeches, interviews, and social media. We like to imagine the characters in movies and shows are one thing, while these other media types we get to see behind the curtain and better understand who they are in real life. But it's possible this is not the case. Or maybe it is. There's no way to conclusively prove that one way or the other. It, it's the easiest thing in the world to claim, and it's impossible to refute, and that's what makes it a meaningless standard. But it's still worth considering that she's just crafting a character she thinks the public will like, and doesn't do a great job reading the room. So let's look at some of the highlights from her pantheon of speeches, interviews, and social media whatevers. The first clip that really announced its presence with authority... I want to bring the heater to announce my presence with authority. To announce your what? To announce my presence with authority. ...would be the Crystal and Lucy Awards in June of 2018. Am I saying that I hate white dudes? No, I'm not. We have to give some consideration to context here. It's at the Women in Film Awards celebrating forward-thinking women of the film industry, as compared to backward-thinking women, whoever they may be. It's not like she's going to say, thanks for the award, hey, go easy on the makeup, gals, or you end up looking like the business end of an orangutan. Honey, you got real ugly. It's going to be something that plays a victim card for sympathy, and makes a call to give us more whatever the fuck. More money, more freedom, more air. Sure, more air. I mean, you can see what she's thinking. I'll take a petulant shot at Hollywood show reporters who reviews I don't like and score some activist points against a group nobody is going to rush to defend. 
which is all true, but only works if your delivery has enough subtlety to land on Hollywood show reporters of the top 100 grossing films, and not white men in general. And Captain Marvelous doesn't do subtle with the microphone in hand. It's a speech with an interesting reinterpretation of demographic breakdowns, uh, I might add. 30% white men, 30% white women, 20% men of color, and 20% women of color. I guess if you're not white, you've been franchised into the people of color group and can give your identity as a black, Asian, Native American, or Latino a kiss goodnight. I'll miss you. But regardless of audience, why push this issue other than she's just petulant in general and of an ill humor to tolerate the professional criticisms of the lower classes? What alternate perspective can we benefit of the doubt her? Well, Captain Marvel started principal photography in spring of the same year, so it could be she's establishing herself in the public eye as an activist for a film that's going to push an agenda, which has a logic to it. If the target market views the lead in a message film as disconnected to the message, it can be a miss. Casting is funny like that. Professional entertainers also have another dimension to the imposter syndrome to contend with, in that they earn incredible amounts of money and receive extensive amounts of praise, what is largely an inessential and easily replaced commodity. If people couldn't pass their time watching sports or movies, they'd continue to survive. They'd read a book or throw squirrels or something. Take that punishment, heathen! Wow! Oh! Giant! Oh, on Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, a psychological study on human needs and motivations written by Abraham Maslow in 1943, it doesn't even register. Being an audience to a show is something we enjoy, but not a thing we actually need. Not to mention these clowns aren't working 40, 50, 70 hour weeks, 50 weeks of the calendar year like the rest of us peasants. So there's a guilt factor that comes into play with the imposter syndrome, knowing there aren't really strong logical arguments to say an entertainer deserves the money they receive. To diffuse this feeling they can fixate on the people who earn even more than they do, pretend the rest of us don't exist, they can convince themselves their brand of entertainment has some greater intrinsic value to people that justifies its earnings. Well, being an actor is no different than being a rugby player construction work, and save for the fact that my tools are the mechanisms that trigger human emotion. Or they can parrot whatever social or political jargon seems to be in vogue at this 15 minutes and reframe themselves as morally righteous activists, championing liberty and fair dealing, fighting for the rights of the oppressed, thereby earning a life of financial privilege and purple ease from your own personal sacrifices for the cause. Denial, not just a river in Africa. The next clip that people took notice of was the Wired Autocomplete segment in March of 2019, where Captain Marvelous answers the most searched questions on the interweb relating to her. The question about whether she works out delivers the best sound bite ever. Is that like a personal attack or something? It's like a key that fits in every lock for a content creator. Great line. Thanks for that one, baby girl. There isn't any politics or social commentary here to polarize some section of the audience, but man, does she come off as hair-trigger defensive. Do the questions upset her this much? Her body language alone is off-putting. Let's take the working out question. Who do we assume is searching the web for an answer to that? She seems to think it's judgmental pricks perceiving some flaw in her appearance and taking a shot at her, but dollar to a dime, it's young girls who want to look like her and are wondering what the right way to go about it is. Do I need to lift weights? Do yoga? Is it a diet thing? It's the question by people who aspire to look like you, not people who are laughing at your appearance, you ape. I used to think that saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, was just sour grapes that I want an argument and someone didn't like it. But now I'm not so sure. It's all in how you say it. This suggests to me the kind of defensive overcompensation people with anxiety and poor self-esteem often make. People who struggle with anxiety have a lot of trouble with social interactions that don't seem difficult at a glance, but they are. It's easy for me to be in front of people. That's a very different thing than being with people. Being in front of an audience performing for them is a way to create a space between you and others that feels safe. While being with them, a person can feel intensely vulnerable and exposed. With low self-esteem, every impromptu social interaction feels like it could be an attack. And with poorly controlled anxiety, every response to a perceived attack overshoots the mark. It's an overcompensation that's unfortunate, but not unusual. People who are bullied may take on the characteristics of a bully. To reinforce to themselves and others, they won't be put in that position again. Or they can lash out at even the mildest implication of being on the short end of a power imbalance, because they haven't worked out that second tier on Maslow's hierarchy of needs relating to esteem, and how to comfortably see themselves, and see themselves in relation to others. An unfortunate outcome of social anxiety is poor interpersonal relations, and we see Captain Marvelous really excel at making friends and influencing others in her promotional work for the MCU in 2019. Tom Cruise over here? No, I'll be the first me, not the next Tom Cruise. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I mean... He not the most comfortable back and forth banter with Chris Hemsworth. Although there's some tongue in cheek with the cast's interpersonal dynamics, if you watch the whole interview, you'll see it. it's an ongoing joke. 
So this may be overblown. There's been a sort of a passing of the torch, and uh, Bree just has to not screw it up. <laughs> well, that ended up being a pathetic statement. In another of these promos, Jeremy Renner is saying a lot without saying anything. For those that don't pick up on body language indicators, that would be irritation. Although he could be irritated with the interviewer, catering, anything. It's not a certainty he's annoyed with Captain Marvelous. Now, everyone has coworkers they don't gel with on a personal level, so we can maybe shrug at these interviews. But then again, there may be something to take note of here. Brie was homeschooled. How long or at what developmental stage, I couldn't say. But there are some social aspects to homeschooling that parents really need to account for, or it shows in later years. You can make the argument that schools, as we understand them, and whatever social influence they provide, don't predate the 19th century, which isn't a long period of time. But I can counter that neither did leaving your village to interact with strangers. So if you're coming out to touch grass, best learn some social skills there, Playa. I speak jive. Oh, good. Anyway, the first social aspect is a comprehension of comparative abilities. People in isolation tend to think they're either much smarter or much dumber than they actually are. How tall is Brie Larson? Uh, uh, Take your time. It's a difficult question. The second is positive interpersonal skills. You learn to avoid provoking unintended conflicts largely through trial and error, interacting with a wide range of personality types, not by insulating yourselves within a family unit or people that like you. Captain Marvelous may come off as conceited because that's how she feels about others. Or from a homeschool bubble to a Hollywood bubble, she just never learned how to comfortably interact with a wide range of people in a way that isn't off-putting to some degree. If that's the case, then it's unlikely she's worked out the third tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs on how to form positive relationships that fulfill the need for belonging, which if true is really too bad. Next on our media tour de force, we have Captain Marvelous's often repeated interview at the D23 convention in September of 2022. Will you play Captain Marvel for? No, no, no. I don't know. Does anyone want me to do it again? What? <laughs> don't be so modest. I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Yeah, that's off-putting as well. This is the same show where Rachel Zegler popped off. Did the mouse have an open bar at that convention? Was there something in the water? Almost any professional actor would answer that softball question about making sequels with some bland tropes. You're gonna have to learn your cliches. It's pretty boring. Of course know? it's boring. I just want to give it my best shot, and the good Lord willing, things will work out. Sticking with Maslow's hierarchy for the moment, this would be more problems in the second tier, esteem. This time with the dimension of esteem that deals with the perceived respect given by others. If you produce works for public consumption, you've kind of enfranchised anyone who views them to weigh in on your performance. So you're going to see praise, constructive criticism, unconstructive criticism, and dumb fuckery. I mean, I get all four versions, and goddamn, you can see the volume of traffic that comes through my channel. It comes with the territory, amigo. You don't get to say anyone can pay to view my performance, but if you have anything to say regarding it, other than effusive praise, shut your face. That's not how the game is played! Most dumb fuckery online is just attention-seeking anyway. Why are you giving the jackals what they want? You don't reward bad behavior. If someone perceives feedback of any kind as an attack to lash out at, that's a legit mental health problem. Full stop. No, I am not wrong. No, you are not okay. Captain Marvelous's remarks at the Baby Girl Awards seem motivated by animosity over criticism. The response in the D23 interview seems motivated by animosity over criticism. And her latest comments about putting the MCU behind her seem motivated by animosity over criticism. If anything outside of agreeing with whatever I say and going along with whatever I do is perceived as an attack, it is not reasonable to expect a happy life or satisfying career. You know, this is so bad, I can't even joke about it. Now Maslow's hierarchy isn't the end-all be-all of insights into human needs and motivation, but it's been around since 1943 because it has some merit. Brie Larson's psychological and safety needs on the first two tiers are met, but I have real doubts about the belonging and esteem needs, which is going to get in the way of attempting to meet the need on the highest tier of Maslow's hierarchy, self-actualization. The idea of the tiers is you have to have the one below mostly sorted out before you can realistically do much with the next one above it. But life teaches you how to live it, and hopefully you work your way up to meet all the human needs and find happiness and peace with yourself and others. The self-actualization tier at the top would constitute becoming the person you really want to be, feeling true acceptance of yourself, and reaching your fullest potential as a person. And on that note, we turn our attention to Bree's social media platforms. Well, YouTube anyway. I shit-canned all my other social media accounts years ago, and ain't creating new accounts for a video segment. Fuck that, man. YouTube is an open forum for sharing personal interests. As long as you're dodging the copyright claims, Motherfucker. You can share the things that you enjoy interacting with, and hopefully others of similar interests will be informed or entertained. 
I don't get the impression that Bree is using it for that reason. The whole thing feels a little manufactured in a look how normal like you I am sort of way. I can maybe believe an actress accustomed to movie sets where they get many attempts at a scene feels intimidated by acting in a play or something in front of a live crowd, which she's done in the past without issue, but I'm hard pressed to believe she's really nervous here while screen capturing a few hellos of some really authentic looking people that she or her assistants will edit before posting. To circle back to my point of Brienne de Saunier playing the character of Brie Larson, it feels like she assumed if she made the character an activist Brie, people would like that character, which many did, but a greater number than she expected didn't. So now the character is recast as a down-to-earth regular person Brie, which she doesn't seem to feel comfortable playing, so it's off-putting. Oh, this is awkward. And now her latest appearances have suggested another character turn, from just a regular person Brie to sexy as fuck Brie. Damn! I'm, I'm not looking at her breasts. You're looking at her breasts. I'm not... I... <laughs> Wait, what were we talking about again? Focus. Anyway, this may not be a bad pivot for getting people to like you. Well, getting guys to like you anyway. Girls tend to resent pretty girls. But is that what you want? By your mid-30s, you ought to know who you are and what you want in life. If you grew up in the U.S., especially in California, there's going to be strong messaging that to be successful, you need to be attractive, rich, famous, and influential. When you're young, you say, okay, that's what I need to be a success. Then people will like me and I'll be happy. Along the way, you realize not a single one of those things has the value you thought it did. Money isn't real, George. Doesn't matter. It only seems like it does. True self-actualization is a different path altogether. Bree has gained all the things which, according to popular culture, ought to make her a success, and therefore, she ought to be happy. Which maybe she is, but I don't know. This all looks pretty forced to me. So does this person deserve sympathy or not? Let's see if we can summarize and come to a decision. The general view on the fuck sympathy side is she's an arrogant, spiteful, smug, insincere jerk who doesn't tolerate ideas that aren't her own. That's very possible. Although, I see a person with poorly controlled anxiety. I see a person who is more at ease with being in front of people than with them. I see a person who expresses herself in an ultra-defensive way that may speak more to personal inadequacy than spitefulness. I see someone who lacks social awareness to a degree. I see someone who can't process criticism on any level. So where does that leave us? Well, summarizing didn't get the train into the station, so let's diagram some shit out. On the one side, we have intent. Those would be the things that are uniquely self. Our ideas, motives, goals, values, etc. Inside, I am... I am more. On the opposite side, we have impacts. These would be the ways we affect others, either directly in their lives or indirectly in how they feel about things. Connecting the self and others are our actions. It's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you. Our intentions inform our actions, which make an impact on others. Does it matter if an intent is good, if the action or resulting impact are bad? If a person doesn't intend to be a jerk, but they are, do their intentions really matter? But then again, how much time can we spend concerning ourselves with other people's judgments? Social animals we may be, but it isn't healthy to fixate on everyone's response to everything we do. I'm not responsible for what others think. I'm responsible for what I am. So which of these three ought to be the criteria to base a judgment off of? It can't be intense alone. Most of us at some point in time have had to listen to a significant other argue that because they didn't intend to hurt our feelings, it's not their fault that they did, which we all love. Try again. It can't be actions alone. Actions in a vacuum without consideration of intent or impact are devoid of the context needed to make a value judgment. That doesn't mean anything. It can't be impacts alone. Fuck me, find someone who isn't offended at something these days. Obviously, I offended you in some way. But since you're a man who can find an insult in a bouquet of roses, I'm not sure quite how. So where does that leave us when deciding whether to prescribe sympathy for Brie Larson? Okay, maybe I'm just overthinking this one. She's probably just a jerk. Fuck him. But I always have some sympathy for the swines of this world provided I don't have to deal with them on a daily basis, and they don't do actual harm to others. Have it your way. That's just how I roll. Anyway, I'm Dr. Balthazar. Thanks for the view. Always appreciated. Like what you like, don't you don't. It's all your call, Kimasabi. Take it easy, everyone.